Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om 
नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Reading from Canto 10, Chapter 47, entitled "The Song of the Bee." This is verse number 30. Atma yevatma natman ham, sridye ham yanu palaye, atma maya nu bhavena. ुनात्मनाुनात्मुनात्मुनात्म आत्मेवात्मनात्मा ladies Atmani, within myself, Eva, indeed, Atmana, by myself, Atmanam, myself, Sriye, I create, Hanmi, I destroy, Anupalaye, I sustain, Atma. my own maya of the mystic potency anubhavena by the power bhuta the material elements indriya the senses guna and the modes of nature atmana comprising Krishna speaking by myself i create sustain and withdraw myself within myself by my power by the power of my personal energy which comprises the material elements the senses and the modes of nature i read it again by myself i create sustain and withdraw myself within myself by the power of my personal energy 
which comprises the material elements, the senses, and the modes of nature. Very, very succinct, short purport. Although the Lord is the supreme entity, there is no absolute duality between him and his creation, since the creation is an extension of his being. This oneness is here emphasized by the Lord. Om Agyan Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyati De Satarine Vancha kalpa tarubhischa kripa sindhu bhevacha patitanam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namaho namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadara Sivasari Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Prabhupada Ki. So before I begin, I seek the blessings and permission and also hope your prayers that I can somehow or other say something that will be beneficial. <laughs> so of course, today is uh, Dasera. And I was asked to speak on that, and I will, but I want to be, just make a few comments on this purport. Here, the absolute truth is being revealed in its completeness. Achintya beta beta tattva, simultaneously one and different. The energy of the Lord and the Lord, in one sense, are different and non-different. <laughs> The materialists, or the people in the material world, they make that separation. There is God, and then there is his energy. And they're either devoted to one or the other, or a combination of both. Closer? Farther, or this way? Oh, okay. Is that better? Because there's a little echo, so, you know. It's hard to hear. Okay. And therefore, they worship the material energy in the sense that they're always looking to gain something from material activities for sense gratification and for some material profit. And they see the Lord as the controller of the material energy, but one who gives, fulfills their material desires. <laughs> Well, we know that the material energy is not meant to simply fulfill the desires of the living entity, but to provide the reactions of their activities. So according to the nature of their activities, and according to the quality of that activities, it's, they plug into a particular aspect of the material energy, either goodness, passion, or ignorance, and by the quality of that energy and the, the activity performed, there's a particular result. And, but they pray to God in order to get some benefit from their material activities. And when they don't, then they blame God. And if they do, they give credit to themselves. <laughs> That's the nature of the materialist. They always are if they're successful, at least according to their own understanding, then they give credit to themselves. And if things don't go according to their, they blame God for not providing. <laughs> But devotees know that the material in maya dakshena prakriti suyate sacharacharam etu nanana kunti jagavi parvi partante is Krishna's energy and it works under his arrangement. And of course, people get the reactions according to their activities. 
But that material energy is one sense separate and not separate from the Lord simultaneously. It's separated by the nature of consciousness and it's connected by the nature of consciousness. So when the consciousness is connected to the Supreme Lord in, in devotional activity, material energy works in order to, to uh, bring the, the devotee or the person engaged in devotional service closer to Krishna. For the materialist, that same energy separates them even farther from the Lord because they look for material benefits from their activities and see the Lord as simply the provider of their sense gratification. So here, the, the absolute truth is very nicely described. It's one with and different from Krishna at the same time. So the devotees, they see the material energy in both sense, they use the material energy to serve the Lord and therefore they connect with the Lord through the material energy. So there's the oneness. And when they also see that material energy is also bringing the reactions of the activities through the, either the daivi prakriti or the material energy or spiritual energy or the para prakriti or apara prakriti the spiritual energy or the material energies. So devotees see the material energy in connection with Krishna. It's like one time somebody asked Srila Prabhupada, uh, uh, how can we see Krishna everywhere? So, I mean, probably they asked it. Prabhupada got every question possible. <laughs> and that was good because today everything is clear because Prabhupada was able to clarify all of the doubts and make everything understandable in a very, in a very powerful and direct way. So Prabhupada, in order to illustrate an example, he held up his glasses and he said, uh, when you see my glasses, what do you see? Or what do you think? When you see my glasses, what do you think? And the devotees naturally responded, well, we see they're, they're your glasses, they belong to you. Yes. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, that's the way you should see everything in relationship. Everything is, belongs to Krishna, everything is Krishna's energy. And ultimately, everything is meant for Krishna's pleasure. So, in that way, the devotees are never separated from Krishna, even when they interact with the material energy because they see everything in relationship to Krishna. It's his energy. <laughs> Today is Dashera. It's a very auspicious day. It indicates something very uh, important in the execution of devotional service. Um, the process of Krishna consciousness is to purify oneself and ultimately attain pure Krishna conscious. And at the same time, it has another part, and that is to spread that same message or that same purity through the form of the Sankirtan movement all around the world. And so this dasera represents the victory of righteousness, goodness, and spirituality over irreligion, evil, inauspiciousness. And the pastime is really insignificant. It mentions in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita, that there are two kinds of created beings, divine and demoniac. So there's the class of living entities who are demoniac by nature, and there are planets where these personalities, these living entities reside. And so demons are not only formulated by activities, but they're actually born into that same consciousness. So there are these two qualities or two characteristics, and Prabhupada said, and of course the scriptures emphasize, that there is a constant competition in order to 
gain control of the material energy. The devotees want to gain control of the material energy so they can use it in the service of the Lord. And the demons want to control it for their own sense gratification in various ways. So these two classes of people are always at loggerheads with each other. <laughs> And if you read the Bhagavatam, because we do, and of course all the scriptures, there's this constant battle between goodness and irreligion, or righteousness, spiritual consciousness, material consciousness. Constantly, this battle is going on. In 1972, Prabhupada was giving a lecture based on one verse from the Bhagavatam, where he's talking about that Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And he was also describing how, um, as Kali Yuga goes on, um, the demons will become more and more profuse. And he told the devotees, but don't worry. <laughs> he said, don't worry, Krishna will protect you. He says, the demons will give you trouble, they'll cause disturbances, but don't worry. Prahlad Maharaj got so many disturbances, but because he fully took shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord, in devotion he was completely untouched. Prabhupada used him and also Devaki in relationship to Kamsa's harassment with Devaki. So Prabhupada was talking a lot about this contention between these two factors of living beings, the demons and of course, the devotees are peaceful by nature, but the demons always cause disturbances. Prabhupada also said in one lecture, he said, we have no problem with Maya. Maya is actually you know, a devotee, and she works to help the devotees actually come to Krishna consciousness. But there are so many disturbances the world, in the world because of the demons. <laughs> And because Maya has to do her duty, she has to serve the demons also. So he says, she's probably made the point, we have no problem with Maya, it's the demons. They're always causing disturbance everywhere. And so you look at the history of, of the world and you'll see it's constant. So two, two million years ago, as described in the Treta Yuga at that time, there was this constant war between goodness and evil. I'm not going to try to narrate that whole pastime. <laughs> it's not possible. I could, but I don't want to because it's not possible in the time frame we have. But today is the actual day where actually Ram achieved victory or righteousness received victory. So I'll narrate a little bit about the details of that. After Hanuman had come to Lanka and he had found Sita in the Ashoka Grove and he had uh, assured Sita that Ram was there and he was thinking about her but he doesn't know where she is, now he will go back and alert Ram to her presence and Ram will come and save her. He gave her complete assurance. And so Hanuman left and he went back to where the monkey armies were stationed along with Ram on the shore of the Indian Ocean. And he had uh, given that message to Ram. Ram became extremely happy when he had, he had heard that Sita was found. Hanuman had given the assurance that she was still being harassed, but somewhere she was still pure says safe but at the same time in a miserable and unhappy condition. So Ram c created a festival and he rallied all the monkey soldiers and they made an, an all-out attack on Lanka. <laughs> and it's described. And the battle had been going on constantly for many, many days. But now Ram wanted to get right to the essence. He, now he knew where Sita was and so he fought really, really strongly. And then that this, uh, at that time, all of the generals, practically all of the generals of uh, Ravana's army had been killed in the battle. Now there was nothing left to stave off the monkey armies except Ravana had to come out personally and join the fight. And so he did. 
And when he came onto the battlefield, of course, all of the Rakshastras, they just roared in jubilation. Uh, and, but when Ram came, the monkeys did the same. <laughs> there was a uproar on both sides. And then the fight between Ram and Ravana was really, really powerful. In fact, they fought so valiantly, firing arrows and various types of weapons at each other, that the rest of the armies completely stopped. <laughs> and they just wanted to watch the battle. It was so powerful. Now, Ram was giving the chariot by Indra, of Indra's personal chariot, along with his chariot driver, Matali. So now he had a very powerful and very qualified chariot driver and the chariot of Indra himself. So he boarded that chariot, of course, Ravana was on his pushpaka, and the battle was fight on different levels, on the ground, in the air, they were firing arrows. But as Ram was firing arrows, and he would cut off the heads of uh, Ravana, the head would fall off, and another head would grow up, and then he would fire another one. And another head would, would fall off, and another head would go back. And after some time, there was a hundred heads on the battlefield, and Ravana was still there. <laughs> sometimes he had multi-heads, sometimes he became one-headed. He was using all of his, his illusions and his, his mystic power in the fight. So Ram was getting a little bewildered. I can't kill this rascal. My arrows were so effective against, he, may, he named so many demons like Virada and Karna, many of the generals that Ram had killed. So many powerful persons that Ram had killed. He was thinking, my arrows are, are never invincible. Who was this powerful person? He couldn't figure it out. <clears throat> and then the battle was going on and Matali said to Ram, you know, why are you playing around with him? Come on, just finish him off. <laughs> so, and he reminded him that actually Lord Brahma had given you this weapon. It's a very powerful arrow. It was actually made by Lord Brahma. The feathers were made from Garuda. Uh, the shaft was made out of ethereal energy. And it was a very powerful weapon. And when Ram was at... Uh, Panchavali, yeah, in the forest that time, he said, use this only when you actually need it. And Ram had forgotten, that's at least it's described that way, that he had had, he forgot this arrow. So then, after we were reminded, he took out that arrow. And as soon as he took out that arrow, the whole universe started to shake. <laughs> and he put it on his bow. And when he pulled it back, everybody was falling to the ground because of the violent shaking of just putting the arrow on his bow. And then with careful aim, he fired that arrow. I'm not gonna try and you know, imitate that one. That one's not imitatable. <laughs> and he fired that arrow and went whew, right into the heart of Ravana, came out the other side, went into the ground and went around the world, came back up and into the quiver of Ram. And as soon as that arrow went back into the quiver, Ravana collapsed and he was dead. Jai Sidam! <laughs> hey, devotees are very nonviolent, but you know, when it comes to killing demons, we get excited. <laughs> There's a class of people, they like to read about the pastimes of the Lord, but mostly their, carry, their focus is on Krishna, Leela, and the gopis. And when it comes to Krishna or, or Ram killing demons, they kind of avoid that. But devotees find great happiness in hearing how the demons are killed, because actually, for the demons, it's actually their benefit. <laughs> 
they become free from their demoniac qualities and they actually, in many cases, of course, in this case, they attain liberation. So now with Ravana dead, now I should make one point. That arrow was given by Augusta Muni. It's in interesting in that sense that Ram is the supreme personality of Godhead, but he took help from a sadhu in order to accomplish his mission. He didn't have to because he is invincible in all sense of the word, but he did just to teach another lesson is that success in spiritual life is Guru and Krishna. <laughs> not just Krishna or not just Guru. The Mayavadis, you know, Guru Brahma, Guru Shiva, Guru Bra, Guru this, Guru that, Guru's feet are all over the universe, right? They worship just Guru. And they think that when you, you know, you attain realization of who you are, you actually become the guru. So actually they're just trying to glorify their own idea of, of becoming guru themselves. But they have no regard for the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then there's another class of people, they, we call them the Sahajyas. They worship just the Supreme Personality of Godhead in their own idea on how they do it. They don't want to be bothered so much with the idea of spiritual master. They think you can approach the Lord directly because we have a direct relationship with the Lord. Of course, their approach is sentimental and it's based not on nothing authoritative. I remember when I was in New Vrindavan, Srila <clears throat> uh, Prabhupada had come and uh, this was the, practically the first time I had seen Prabhupada. So Prabhupada was there and Guru Puja was be just about to begin. And so the devotees were there and Prabhupada with many of his senior disciples were there. And one of our devotees was asked to lead the Guru Puja, one of the devotees in the Vrindavan. So he did. And he finished the, the whole prayer of the Guru Puja and then he stopped. And Prabhupada immediately looked at his servant, who was pushed to Krishna Maharaj at that, and he signaled to him, and he picked up the Murdanga and started to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So later on we were thinking, well, why did Prabhupada do that? And then later we found out that you can't worship Guru without worship Krishna. You shouldn't worship Guru without, that, that worship is incomplete. And you can't worship Krishna without worship Guru. So Prabhupada wanted to make that show us that yes, you're worshiping me as a representative, but I'm a representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So the, that worship goes together, it's not separate. So now with Ravana dead, and then the monkey shoulders just, you know, started to cheer and the rakshasas started to run. And, you know, everything was auspicious. Ravana had been killed. But then Ravana was laying on the ground and all of the, his wives, headed by Mandodari, they came out and they were devastated. They had lost their husband. Uh, Ravana had created a lot of legions amongst himself. He was a powerful person. He was intelligent. He had many good qualities. And he could provide for his citizens, but the only problem, he was a demon. <laughs> One problem. He was a great fighter, gave in charity. Had so many good qualities, but he was a demon. <laughs> that was his problem. There's a nice little story where uh, uh, Vibhishan, this was before the battle, uh, uh, when he had, after he had met Ram, he uh, started to write Ram's name and place it in different places around the kingdom. And then the word got back to Ravana, Ravana came and he saw everywhere he was seeing Rama, everywhere. 
So he became really upset and he found out a Vibhishan did. He went right to Vibhishan, started yelling at him, chastising him, why are, you, why are you writing the name of my enemy? He said, my dear brother, you don't understand. It's not like that. R-A stands for you and M-A stands for Mondo Dari. So it's you and Mondo Dari's name everywhere. Ravana said, very good, put it everywhere. <laughs> so that way Ram's name was all over the kingdom. <laughs> you know, when, you work, when you're dealing with cheaters, you have to cheat, you know. <laughs> Says that. So now he's laying there on the battlefield and the widows are really in a very pitiful and mournful condition, just crying, grabbing the body of their husband. And Ram wasn't happy to see that, and so he said to Vibhishan, I think you should perform the last rites immediately, the funeral rites. And Vibhishan immediately started to respond by saying, my brother, he was so sinful, he captured other people's wives, he was, you know, he, came, he was starting to criticize him in every way. I don't want to do it. <laughs> in other words, he refused. But Ram said, no, actually, Ravana was a great hero. It says there's two kinds of heroes. Those who become devotees are heroes and those who don't, do not flee in, on the battlefield. That's mentioned in the Bhagavatam in one verse. So Bharava, Ravana was powerful and he was brave. So in one sense he was a hero, although he was a demon. So Ram glorified him in that way and then Vibhishan was convinced and then he performed Alas, writes for Ravana. Then Ravana, then Ram turns to Hanuman and says, go find Sita and tell her the news that Ram is, Ravana is finished. So Hanuman goes to the Ashoka Grove and she's still surrounded by these Rakshasras who are calling her names and harassing her. So Hanuman's getting a little upset and now he's, he wants to do something. So he decides that he's going to do something to these Rakshashis. But Sita is very kind. She's very compassionate. She says, no, no, they're just foolish ladies. They don't know what they're doing. You know, they're just acting out of, the, out of their, you know, their, their demoniac nature. So please don't do anything. So Hanuman listened to the prayers of uh, Sita. And then she told a story which is a really an interesting story, how one should forgive even an enemy. <laughs> and the story is that there was one uh, hunter, he was in the forest, and as he was hunting, a tiger came. And he got uh, frightened from the tiger and he ran. So he was looking for shelter and he ran up a tree and he took shelter of a tree. And in the tree there was a bear. And so the, the lion says to the bear, you know, he's our common enemy. Push him out of the tree. The bear says, no, I can't do that because he takes shelter of my home. Therefore, I must give him protection. And so, and then um, the bear, after some time, went to sleep. And then the, the lion said to the hunter, hey, push the bear out. You know, if I eat him, I won't harm you. <laughs> so the hunter decided, yeah, good idea. So he pushes the bear, but the bear falls and he catches onto one branch and he somehow saves himself. Then the lion says, see, what a, what a rascal he is. He tried to kill you, now you can push him out. And the bear says, I cannot do that. Even though he's acted as an enemy, a devotee never makes another person an enemy, even though the enemy makes that person their enemy. So Sita told that story to kind of illustrate that even though they tried to cause so much harm, she was in one sense forgiving. And then he told her, then he left, went back to Ram, and told her that Sita's fine, She's there. And then Ram sent Vibhishan. He said, Vibhishan, go tell her that Ram wants to see her right away. 
she should take a bath and decorate herself very nicely and come. So Vibhishan came, he approached Sita, told her exactly what Ram said. She said, no, I want to come immediately. I don't want to take a bath or get decorated. She said, he said, that's Ram's order, you do that. So he convinced her, she got herself ready, she got onto a palaquin, they carried her into the presence of Ram. Now the monkeys had never seen Ram, um, Ra Asita, so they were so excited that Sita was coming. So they wanted to see what Ram was sacrificing everything for, <laughs> this personality who was his transcendental consort. But they were making a stampede in a fuss. You know, monkeys, you know what they do. They, you know, they need to try to, ever try to control monkeys? It's not possible. It's like trying to herding, it's, it's like trying to herd cats. You ever try to herd cats? You know, it doesn't work. Monkeys are the same, but even worse. So anyway, they were going and then Vibhishan was pushing him back. He was getting really disturbed with the monkeys and Ram said, no, no. Let them see Sita. It's okay, this is a battlefield, she's okay. They can see Sita. So he pacified Vibhishan. And now Ram went into a very pensive mood. He started to become very silent and very grave. As Sita approached, she came there and she offered beautiful prayers to Ram. And Ram didn't do anything. He remained silent. And everybody was looking, why? Ram looks quite upset. He's not speaking. And nobody would even speak to Ram. His, his gravity was so powerful that they, nobody could even talk to Ram. There was something disturbing. And then after Sita had made her prayers and was happy to be back with Ram, he said, actually you are impure. You have been touched by another man. I know it's not possible for a lady to be there that long with Ravana to not be violated in some, so you are impure. So therefore, I cannot accept you back. You may go wherever you want to go. My God, it was like a thunderbolt, not only to Sita, but to everybody. And Sita, she controlled herself. She understood that there's no other solution. If I cannot be with Ram, there's no reason I don't want to be at all. So she calls Lakshman over and she says, build a funeral pyre. I will enter that pyre, into that fire. Lakshman is shocked. <clears throat> he looks at Ram. Ram's not making any move. He's completely silent. And then he gets the understanding, yeah. So he builds the fire. Sita offers prayers to the fire god for protection. She circumambulates Ram. She circumambulates the fire. And then with complete control of her mind and senses, she walked into the fire. And it was a loud, horrible, horrific roar, from, especially from the ladies and everyone else there. Ah, they started to cry, Sita's gone. But after some time, Ram remained completely stoic there the whole time. His mind was completely, you know, undetectable. Nobody could understand what he was thinking. And then Sita came out of the fire and she was being carried by the fire god. And then Ram understood everything and he smiled. And he said, I have put you through that test because if I would have accepted you back, I would have been criticized. And you know, we also know from the story of the Ramayana when, when Ram was back in Ayodhya and Sita was there with him, there was that one washerman when uh, Ram was going through the kingdom, his daily activity was to go to see how the citizens were doing. So he passed by this one house. He heard some loud talking. The man was chastising his wife. Where were you last night? You were out all night. And now you're coming back to me? You're impure. How can I accept you back? I'm not like Ram. 
And when Ram heard that, whoa, he became really con concerned. I'm being criticized. Because his whole, and the, that he, his, his, his mood was the leader should be beyond, you know, criticism, should be beyond doubt, impeccable quality. That is the quality of a leader. Now he's finding someone who's, and of course, at that time, that's a whole another story where he actually asked Sita to leave and go to the uh, ashram of Valmiki Muni. That same washerman appeared in Krishna Leela. And he was the one, when, when Krishna was walking in a Mathura, he, uh, he was selling clothes. He was a washerman. Yeah, he, was a, he wasn't a washerman in Ram Leela. He was a washerman in Krishna Leela. And he was washing Kamsa's clothes. And then Krishna, he was, Krishna was feeling like really, you know, he was in charge. <laughs> and he walked up and he, and he, uh, he asked for those clothes. And the washerman was insulted. He said, don't you know these are the clothes of Kamsa? You know, you could be killed for just for asking for such things. He starts to chastise Krishna. Krishna didn't waste time with him. Took his hand, choom, just cut off his hand and put his hand in. Choom, like a little tap here and there and finish. <laughs> so that was the same one. So Ram wanted to avoid that by putting Sita through this test of fire, and she passed, and she passed. And of course, there was a great celebration at that time, all the monkey leaders came out, and they all got on, Shiva came, Lord Brahma came, and then Shiva came to Lord Mom and said, you, do you see your father is there? Dasarat had also had come. He had already, the. He had come back from the, from the abode of the heavenly planets. After he left his body, he went to heaven, and he came back just after the, when Ravana was killed. And of course, it was a nice exchange between Ravana, I'm sorry, between Ram and his father. And that's a beautiful exchange, nicely described by Valmiki in the Ramayana. And, uh, and then, Ram, Sita, Hanuman, Ribishan, and many of the monkey generals, they boarded the uh, chariot, the same chariot that Ravana had, the Pushpaka, and they went on to Ayodhya. Now this is, this is a wonderful, wonderful uh, pastime because it illustrates the quality of a perfect leader, as Ram demonstrated, but also the that to take shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead means to become victorious in all sense of the word. So although there is so much difficulties, even today in the world, there are so many demons, as long as we stay close to the Supreme Lord, especially by chanting his holy name and engaging nicely in devotional service, devotees are free from the effects of the demoniac influences, which is so all pervasive into this world. Now, Srila Prabhupada said in 1973, he said, in 50 years, this is, uh, you can hear it on tape, 50 years, this whole Western civilization will be finished. And if you look around, of course, we don't want to waste time looking around, but the world's on fire right now. There's wars everywhere, economic crime. Countries are going through devastations. There's cr so many problems. But at the same time, Krishna consciousness is spreading nicely. So this is Lord Chaitanya's movement. He's taking advantage of the collapse of the, uh, because of the sinful activities of the society, everything is collapsing. And now Lord Chaitanya's movement is looking good. <laughs> so we have to spread this Sankirtan movement everywhere, in every town and village, because this will make the difference. Only by the power of the Sankirtan movement can we purify the world. 
And when people are coming, more and more preaching is becoming so good everywhere you go now. And people are coming forward because they're starting to no longer take shelter of their material plans. They're starting to see it's all, you know, things are difficult. Now they're looking towards spirituality for some relief or some shelter. Okay, so today is also Madhvacharya's uh, appearance, appearance day. I'm supposed to end at nine, right? I'll just make, say a few statements about Madhvacharya because it's very important. We are the Brahma, Madhva, Gaudiya, Sampradaya, so Madhvacharya and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu were both in the Brahma Sampradaya. So they are very con much connected with us in that sense. And Lord Chaitanya also had also met Madhvacharya when Madhvacharya was here. When Madhvacharya actually at one point came to see uh, Vyasadev in Bhadragashram. He was able to go to Bhadragashram and see Vyasadev. After that, he met with Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya actually came to see him. Uh, Madhvacharya, son of the wind god, he was born in 1238 AD. He was, a, he was born in a, I'm not sure, it was a Brahmin family? I'm not sure. Who, I, I don't really know for sure, but his name was Vasudev. His f father, it says when he was five years old, his father had incurred many deaths. His father was in anguish over the debts, worried how to pay the debts. He didn't have the money. So little Vasudev, five years old, he went into the backyard of their home and he gathered some tamarind seeds and he came forward to his father and he said, here, you can pay the debts with this. And as soon as he had them, the tamarind seeds, they all turned to gold. <laughs> That was his first miraculous activity when he was five years old. He would go, play around. He would leave the home and play in different places. And his mother would call him. And wherever he was, he would immediately jump and immediately land up right where his mother was, even if it was a mile away. <laughs> he was powerful. He was the son of the wind god. He had taken shelter when he was older of Achyuta Preksha and learned the science of uh, the Vedan Vedas at that time. He took full shelter and then at the age of 12, he decided to take the sannyas order of life. Now, his guru, Achyuta Preksha, said, you have to get permission from your parents before, you can, before I can give you the sannyas. So he went to his parents explained he wanted to take sannyas. They said, you're, you're, our, you're the only child. We cannot let you do that. If you leave us, what will happen to us? He said, all right, I will stay until you have another child. And then after he's born, then I will go to take sannyas. And they said, fine, okay. So, after some time, another boy was born, his brother. And so he said to his father, now it's time for me to go. And they said, no, you can't go. <laughs> and he decided to go anyway. So he's walking and his father is chasing behind him, son, don't leave, don't leave, don't leave. And at one point his father fell to the ground and paid his obeisances to his son. And that's not usually done <laughs> in Vedic culture. The father pays obeisances. And, and Madhavacharya, of course, he was still Vasudeva. He said, see, this proves I'm a sannyasi. Because no, the father never pays his obeisances to the son unless the son is a sannyasi. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <laughs> And of course, there's many, many stories in, in related to his life. Of course, the story of Udabi Krishna, how he established the deity of Udabi Krishna in, in that area, in that today that is still worshipped with great, great opulence. 
Yes, Pritu Prabhu. <laughs> So coronavirus was coronavirus. <laughs> yeah, it's compassion. <laughs> so there's yeah, there was many benefits that devotees were able to use that apparent difficulty to preach Krishna conscious and also to get their own life together. <laughs> that was me. I had to stop because I was traveling for at least I traveled for thirty some years straight and then I I was getting worn out, so when Ed came, it was a perfect time to stop. And other, many other devotees also took that benefit to go a little internal during that time. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, so it was very beneficial. Anything else? Yes. Oh, okay. Hari Bo, Hari Namananda, Hare Krishna. Um, you mentioned. Well, the definition of evil is described as an absence of good. So there's no substance. Just like what is darkness, darkness is the absence of light. Darkness has no independent nature. It simply when there's no when there's, when there's complete you know diffusion of light, when there's no light, that's darkness. So, evil is in proportion to how much goodness is not there. <laughs> That's all. So, it's more like, yeah, the absence of goodness or the absence of righteousness, like that. So, it's a shadow. It's a shadow reflection of the reality. Therefore, it has no substance, but it appears to, because it's part, it works through the material energy. Just like every living entity is Premupamartha Mahan has pure love for Krishna. Even the demons, they're also lovers of Krishna. But being covered by that material energy, uh, they, they, they lose their understanding of who they are and, that, and then they become covered. That covering is the material energy, which is just a veil over the reality. That's all. <laughs> So, yeah, evil is an absence of good in proportion to how much goodness is absent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yes, Prabhu. Is it Balaram? Goranga. Okay. Why don't you mention that uh, we should serve Guru and Krishna simultaneously? You can't separate them. Well, according to Shastra, if you have accepted a Shiksha Guru, then Shiksha and Diksha are two manifestations of the Supreme Lord who appears in two different aspects of the of Guru Tattva. In other words, both are there and both are equal. Actually, Diksha Guru is one who gives you Shiksha also, but in some cases, Shiksha becomes prominent. So, if we accept a Shiksha Guru, which can assist in our execution of our devotional service, then there is equal, equal regard for both. It's not that. 
Of course, when there, if there's any contention or any difference, then whatever the Diksha Guru says, that should be accepted. But Shiksha should always be in line with Diksha. Therefore, when accepting Shiksha, we should make sure that they're compatible in the way, in the way they, you know, preach. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Does that help? Hare Krishna. He rejected him? Yes. The outward rejected him? Rejected means he rejected, just like Bali Maharaj rejected Shukrachat. So what it means he didn't follow him, disobeyed him? He disowned him. Mm -hmm. In what sense? How did he disown him? How did he, dis how did he, dis maybe someone can help with this. I'm not f so familiar of this Leela here. Yeah, but. he told him because the Diksha Guru was not following and accepting the position of Rahunatha Swami. So therefore, Bhakti Nur Thakur uh, disowned him. That is the explanation. Or, is the, is the explanation is understood as that he accepted Jagannathas Babaji as his prominent guru? or the one that he took, took instructions for. Well, if you don't listen, that doesn't necessarily mean, in one sense, that's rejection, but if the guru is not up to standard, then, then one can not reject, but ultimately you have to instruct, as it says, Narahari Sakar makes that point, in, Bhajana, Bhajana Rahasya, that one particular uh, treatise he wrote, that if the guru goes off, it's the duty of the disciple to try to bring him back. And that's from, that was down during the time of Lord Chaitanya, and he writes that, that one should question the guru. But if there is a difference in the mood, that's not rejection. <laughs> So I'm not sure, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't agree with the idea of rejection, but maybe he became subordinate to Jagannathas Babaji. He didn't follow him. But it, did he make an outward statement that, you know, I'm no longer following you? Disagreement with the guru doesn't mean you reject the guru, or the, reju the guru rejects you. We even have that today, you know, when people read, you know, sometimes devotees disagree with their spiritual master or whatever, but still the relationship is there. Of course, we shouldn't do that, but that happens, of course. But here's the left. Okay. I can't give a, a conclusive statement based on what you said, so... I don't know. I don't know the details now. <laughs> Unless somebody else would like. Maharaj, would you like to give something on that? <laughs> He didn't reject Bhakti Vidal, no. It's an interpretation. So we have to be careful with that. That's what I see it as. It's just an interpretation, yeah. So the principle is that nobody rejects the Guru even if he's fallen. Right. So what you said is right for me. No. Who did? The Diksha Guru of Bhakti Nathakur. Yeah. He accepted that Bhakti Nathakur did Diksha Nathakur. 
Yeah. yeah. It's the same way with the vocation as Babaji Yeah. But there's no question on that. Sort of a strong word. There's no question on the strong word in the Yeah, I, I can't see it either. <laughs> it was just an interpretation. Yeah. And it's a translating point also. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. I don't want to take too much time. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Sri Dasera Ki Jai. Sri Madhvacharya Ki Jai. Gaur Premanande Hiro.